Well, hello and good afternoon or good morning uh, for some of you getting towards good evening. Um, my name is Chris, and I'm actually super thrilled to introduce my very good friend, Holger Niels Paul. And he, Holger is joining us from Germany, where they actually have a vacation day. So he said, when can I best do this webinar? Well, we'll do it on a vacation day because that would make a lot of sense. Oh, now, I, I don't know if you know this, Holger, but I have admired your work for more than 14 years. Mm. Yeah. I've, I've known Holger for about 10 years uh, and we've had a chance to work together in different parts of the world for about nine years. I, I could round it up and say it's 10 years, but that sounds such a long time. So it's, it's not even 10 years. You know, it's barely a couple of years. Like I saw you, but just once now. Yeah. So I've, I've had the pleasure of working closely with Holger in, in large strategy sessions in Asia, um, on small executive sessions in Norway, in Denmark. Uh, we've done work together across Europe for events and for uh, boards and, and C-suites. And what always struck me, and this is kind of you know, framing how much I admire your work, Holger. What really struck me was that we could have like really complicated strategic discussions, like, like really, like you would have 10 people in the room and nobody knew what we talked about. It was really embarrassing. Um, but when we brought Hogger in, he was always able to simplify and visualize. So maybe after a few sessions, people would stand back and say, oh, look, look at our beautiful strategy. We made that. And it was just really obvious that everyone got it. Everyone saw it and everyone bought into it. And I was standing back like, yeah, but you guys were a mess just a few weeks ago. So, so Hogger has this superpower uh, that we call you know, making strategy visual. And of course, that applies to other areas uh, as well. So Holger is going to be sharing some of his, his work. Uh, but last thing I just want to mention, Holger, and, and I know I probably haven't said this enough. Um, if it wasn't for your work, we wouldn't have, you know, the majority of, of stuff that we have with regards to tools and canvases and simulations, because it's all built on your foundation, which is all about Thank visual you. clarity. Uh, which I think is really cool. And then small disclaimer, all of you need to buy Holger's book and you can do it in bulk. So, so don't buy one, buy like 20 and give it out to your friends. They'll, they'll love you for it. Um, Holger, welcome. You're going to give us a um, high level introduction. Uh, tell us about visual thinking and visual clarity and tell us about your background and, and tell us about your horse, but we'll say that for sure. <laughs> okay, so like a quick roundup, uh... Of, of me. So thank you, Chris, for all the nice words. But um, so quick roundup, I, I am a failed architect. So I tried to become an architect, but that was not my way. So after three semesters, I, I broke off the university and became a carpenter. So um, after a few years, um, finally being a carpenter, I thought that might be not enough just doing something with my hands standing all day, although I'm standing now again. But uh, I studied design as well, communication design. And while I was doing all that, I was as well an arts teacher at an art school. So I had, had that background of very creative work. And I started right off, I think it was 2009, um, in my self-employment as a designer, but quickly learned that there is something like graphic recording out there where you stand and kind of capture the, the knowledge and the content that people talk about in a workshop or conference. And from there, I developed then trainings and visual facilitation and the mentoring and coaching that I do nowadays. So it was kind of an up and down in terms of the, of the journey. And uh, I'm always searching basically for the next phase as you do, Chris. And I remember when I met you for the first time, uh, you invited me uh, to your home and you asked right away, why don't you work for Google X? Right? Um, and I think, oh yeah, yeah, I don't know. So um, you were always stretching me there as well. but. Um, I do this uh, for a living with corporates, with individuals now um, working on anything that's regarding the future, strategy, innovation, transformation, right? Business models, all that. Um, the journey is not straight, as I said, as well uh, with my family, uh, it's the same. I have, I would say a huge family. Uh, I have a wife, three kids, and we have a dog, a horse and three rabbits and who knows what's coming as well here in Germany. Uh, we're building our zoo, I always say. 
and it's a lot of fun and of course a lot of chaos in my life too and when it comes to chaos that's basically what I try to help others because for myself it's always difficult but for others that's pretty easy you might recognize that for yourself so that's basically me what I do and um, I think it's it would be interesting to speak about as well why we need clarity perhaps I can start with that Chris for a second let me that uh, share my other camera and please let me know if that works properly that you can see like that me works. The video as well and the camera yep. okay cool so there just to to set the ground and some of you might know the stacy matrix already some of you might not um the what is like what are we dealing with when we say we are dealing with complex challenges and i often take the example of me being a carpenter in the in my former life and um you perhaps let's say chris you come to me and say look hoger i need a new dining table i wanted to be out of oak and wood i have some pictures of the design it needs to be this and that size so you have a pretty defined and clear briefing for me right i would say the uncertainty you could say the uncertainty here is relatively low so uncertainty of how I need to build that, the how uncertainty is low, not high. As well, what I need to do is pretty clear too. I, need to, I know how and what I need to do to make that table. Let me just write uncertainty here for a second. So Stacy calls that the simple domain. All right, pretty simple, straightforward. I know exactly what you need to do. Then Chris could come to me as well and say, look, I need a new dining table. It should be out of wood. I want to seat five to 10 people. And I don't know about the design. That is already not super simple because I need to clarify some questions, right? It's a bit more complicated. But I could still tell Chris, look, I know the questions I have to ask you. I basically know how long it will take me to get that table done. So I'm pretty close to being certain how I need to do that. But then there are two other domains that we face nowadays, and they are pretty close to each other. And that will be the case when Chris is coming to me and says like, look, Holger, uh, I mean, Stavanger is nice, but I want to expand somewhere else. We want to buy a new house or property, and we want something to eat at. But we don't know yet which room it will be, uh, living room, sleeping room, kitchen, or all of them, I would assume for a Chris it's all, um, then should we stand, lie, sit, what kind of material? I don't have a clue. That is a task that is close to the chaos domain. I'm not really sure what I have to do there because actually I need to build a new house for Chris until he's sure what he wants to have, or at least it's pretty complex, right? And from chaos and complexity, we can't go straight to certainty because we don't know for sure yet. So if you have a, a project, and I would say a lot of projects from us are nowadays close in the chaos to complexity domain. If you think about innovation, if you think about Chris work, about clusters and transformation, it's all very complex and even chaotic because so many things are moving. You have to first navigate a bit in one direction, navigate the other way, and navigate your way through in small iterations until you find a point where you say, now I have a bit more of a clear view where I want to get. I would say the behavior to navigate from chaos through complexity down to that point where you can straightforward waterfall uh, project, like finish the thing is where you need to be agile. And a lot of people identify agile with scrum. I just mean you need to be flexible, right? flexible to understand, make small steps and experiments. You need to uh, do experiments and you need to make it visual, right? Because when you are not clear where you are in a certain point here in the complexity and you just talk about it, it's very difficult to figure out where you need to go next. And therefore you need other people. So if we accept that we are in this, in this area, of complexity and chaos, I would say we need to embrace the agile mindset. And that is, has a lot to do with the, with the visual tools to yeah, get over that. So 
if we take that as a given, and Chris, you stop me if you want to interrupt me or are of another opinion, of course. If we see that and we say, and accept that you have complex challenges. The question is, what is a complex challenge? A complex challenge is defined when you are standing here, right? This is now me and you, and you try to figure out a challenge. For example, in innovation, business model innovation or whatever you want to call it, you might have customers in the game. You might have your colleagues, pieces of your team, new technology that's emerging, perhaps even a new industry that's coming into your field, perhaps the idea of new clusters developing, uh, perhaps even, I mean, you need a service or a product, a value proposition. All those things are floating around within your complex challenge. The thing is, while you try to understand your customers, new technology comes to the market and the thing that you knew before is already changed. The same goes for your colleagues. They might develop other opinions, right? And go in other directions as well. A cluster might quicker expand that you think. So a complex challenge has another challenge within that is that everything is changing all the time while you try to solve it. And to solve complex challenges, you need to understand not only the different elements, but the connections between them. How are things connected? How are the customers connected to the cluster, to the technology? How do they use it? What are the problems? How can we team up with our colleagues, create stronger bonds, build more better teams, all that kind of stuff. When you understand the connections and the different elements, it becomes easier to solve a complex challenge. And then the last point on this is you see that from the left here, right? You could say, perhaps you see only this part of the problem and the challenge because you have your point of view. So it's way easier to do that with other people. So let's draw quickly a team here on the side, like these people to help you. Could be your colleagues, could be customers in the best case, whoever that is, and you work together on that challenge because they see that part or they know about that part. Now is the challenge when you think in one way about this challenge and you see parts of that and the team and the colleagues you're working with are having something else in mind, how do you align on that? And here comes visual tools because if you put all your thoughts on a shared surface that might be a digital whiteboard, a visual tool, whatever it is, or a piece of paper, you can externalize your thoughts and get some information back and they can do the same. And therefore you create alignment and you get to better outcomes and you're actually able to solve those complex challenges that we try to solve. And that's why I think we need visual tools to solve the complex challenges we're dealing with. Olger, I love this webinar so much. This is super cool. Um, could you... Could, could, could I invite you to expand on this? Um, now, you have a lot of really good content in the book. I mean, of course you do. Yeah. Um, and, and to quote my good friend here in, in Panama, uh, this is amazing. Could you give us a maybe a case study or a specific example with one of the tools, anything that you have you know, from your bag or from your book, and just show us what this looks like with a with specific example, kind of the next step, if you will. The next step. Yeah. So, uh, but, but, but again, you know, I'm not going to interrupt you. This is super cool. No, that's good. I'm happy for the question. So um, one of the things I need to, I need to make one more round on this because mm -hmm. I think it's important for any project that you have, right? Any, it might be solving a challenge. It might be working on business model innovation, whatever it is you have. I, I identified basically three phases that you have in every project. I think that's important to mention first before I give you the case. And these three phases will occur even if you run a workshop um, or as I said, a longer project. And they underlie every methodology that you use. It might be Lean Startup, it might be Scrum, it might be Design Think, you pluck, pluck in everything. But when you see that every project should start with understand, you want to understand the challenge that you want to solve, the problem that you have to solve or the customers that you serve, right? Or how does my product work? You start with understand, 
only after you understand what you really want to do, you start the create phase. And I know a lot, like a lot of you might love the create phase because it's brainstorming, being creative, like all that kind of fancy stuff. But I see, and Chris, I'm not sure how it is for you. I see so many companies and clients jumping into ideation and solving the wrong problem, spending so much time on it. It's a, it's a pity, right? So I say, start with understand, then create the solution. And don't forget that you need to somehow create a presentation so you can share what you've done with the world. Because so many great ideas are not coming to fruition or because they are shared in a bad way, right? Nobody wants to listen to a text file or a boring PowerPoint presentation or something. So you could have the best idea in the world. If you present it in the wrong way, nobody will buy in. It's a pity as well. So you run through these cycles again and again. It's an iterative cycle of understand, create, share in every project that you have. So when we take this as an example, let me grab sticky notes for a second. <clears throat> I like to, to cluster as well my projects with visual tools here. So for example, um, in understand, I really, I really like the tool that's called the speedboat, right? The speedboat is, is a template from Luke Homan and the idea is you have water on top, you have a speedboat here in the water, and that speedboat has a problem because the speedboat wants to go to the right, but you have a lot of anchors that's holding that speedboat back, right? That's a very rough and quick sketch of a speedboat. Hopefully you can see that well. Um, what you do is you ask your customers or clients, whoever that is, what's holding you back to achieve your goals? It's a big question, important question. What's holding you back? Why can't you achieve what you want to achieve? And people would put small sticky notes right on that speedboat anchors and, and tell you what are their pains, basically. So you understand with this, with this tool what's holding them back. If you want to, and I'm, I'm going just a, like a, in a short, like you could use multiple visual tools. If you then go to the create phase after you perhaps understood what's holding them back, you might go to the innovation pyramid, right? Not sure if everybody is familiar with Chris's innovation pyramid, but it's the idea that you, on the top, you have products and services that you could on marketing design that you could innovate on. And on the bottom, you could even ideate on uh, industry level and business model level and so forth. So it's a great tool to kind of be very focused in your ideation and think beyond just products, right? And services. So you would do a brainstorming focused with the innovation pyramid, creating the solutions. And then you might take a tool to present those solutions quickly. And I like the book cover for that. So the book cover is basically uh, an upfront uh, paper. Some, some people call that napkin sketch as well. You put a title on top. That's the title of your idea. You put a very rough drawing sketch of your idea. How would it work? And perhaps one or two sentences as a subtitle and therefore present what you have developed uh, to your clients or to your colleagues. You perhaps make a voting or whatever you want to. And then with the learning, you go back and do a next cycle. So that would be one example how I would leverage that. And to give you one more specific example on, on this thinking is how I approach pitches. Perhaps that's interesting for a lot of you, our, our listeners too, in terms of if you ever have to pitch uh, to a prospect, right? To a client that you could have. I normally never pitch, right? But two or three years, uh, two and a half years ago, a client reached out to me and said, I have this great team. They, you need to connect to them. It's a great project, but you need to pitch against two other agencies. And I said to her, like, you know, I don't pitch, right? I don't do this. And she said, yeah, but please do that. It's one and a half hour meeting. And I, yeah. so I said, okay, let's do it. So the two other agencies would do a classical pitch. What do you do? You prepare a presentation. You tell how great you are, the experience you have, how well you have thought about the solution of the, the, the request, right, for proposal. But what I did, I created a sequence of tools. So what I did is I used the speedboat. Again, the speedboat, right? I love the speedboat. I used the speedboat to ask 
ask those clients that weren't my clients back then, it was a pitch, right? But I said like, look, I'm sorry, I don't have a presentation. I have a working session for you. So what's holding your clients back? So we had a session with the speedboat asking, what's holding your clients back? We had a conversation on that. We put that basically on a customer profile. You might know that from Alex Osterwalder, the jobs to be done map in terms of what are the jobs of their clients? So what are the jobs of my job, the jobs of the client's jobs? That was my ask as well, the gains and the pains. What do they wish for? What do they fear? And last but not least in that 90 minutes, I had prepared a simple world map. So that is a map with some, some landmarks on it like this here. And I asked them, so where do you see yourself today? And they marked that on the, on the map. And they said, I asked them, if we finish that, pro that project that you want me to do for you, perhaps, where do you see yourself in the future? They said like here. And then I asked like, how does it look there? How does it look here today? And I asked, how do you imagine could we get from today to the finishing line of the project? And that basically I turned into a money proposal, right? Later on, because that gave me the indication, what do we need to do? That was my pitch. I want it. I want, I want multiple pitches that I did uh, since then uh, for some clients, like three or four, uh, still not pitching a lot, but no presentation, just the tools really. And, and what they appreciated is, is the first time that somebody came to them and really wanted to know how they feel, what their struggles are and how they could be helped instead of, this is how great I am. You need to buy my service, right? Um, yeah, those are two more examples, Chris. No, Holger, this is fantastic. I'm, I'm mesmerized and I'm really impressed by, you know, the, the fact that you can, you can actually talk and draw at the same time, which is <laughs> for most of us is different. Yeah. Um, could I, could I ask you a favor? Could you, could you draw almost like you've done on the screen here? Could you draw three canvases, uh, just put up the canvases and keep them blank uh, yeah. for now? <clears throat> because I love what you said about, you know, winning the pitch. Yeah. And I want to try and, and see if we can do the following together. Yeah. So <clears throat> this is this is how I have actually won, or we have won, uh, several projects. Um, we we go into a management meeting, and, and there may have been some conversations initially. Yeah. Uh, they may be expecting a PowerPoint presentation, you know, a traditional kind of consulting approach, and say, you know, this mm -hmm. is all the work that we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, but just like you said. I have frequently showed up for those meetings with a roll of canvases under my arm. Yeah. And I, I want to, I have to test you a little bit here, Holger. Um, are you able to draw the industry shifts map? Do you, do you remember it off the top of your head? Oh, uh, gosh. I know, I know. I, sh I should have prepared this one. You should have prepared me for that. I should have. I th um, um, isn't that the, the one with the, with the squiggle in the center? No, no. Um, I know that that's the one with the with here a big big canvas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, here's yeah. a small one. Yeah. And here's some some fields. Exactly. See, I'm super impressed. No, really well done. Yeah. So yes. the, 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 no, fantastic. So so the industry shifts map is basically a, you know, it, it's a quick external analysis. And it, 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 it's equally a quick internal analysis yes. uh, on, on, on the X and the Y axis. Yes. And, and, and what I tend to do is I, just like you, I'll ask questions. So yeah. what are some of the key drivers in your industries? What are some of the big changes happening in your industry? Yeah. People love it because yeah. you're, not, yeah. you're not speaking at them. You're having a conversation. And then right. they realize, you know, we're actually in a working session, just like you said. Yeah. We, 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 can, we can do about 15 to 25 minutes on that. And then we transition into the second canvas, Holger, which is the strategy intro, which is the ambitions on top. And then you have core growth and explore. Yeah, you have basically the, that's the roadmap thing, right? Nope, not yet, not yet. Okay, so that um, comes here. Let yeah. me see, they have the, um, they have the ambitions on top. And help me with the bottom again. Yeah, the three boxes, core growth explorer. All right, right. That one, yes. Yeah. And for the audience, why I'm why I'm hesitating is I think how many do you have by now, Chris? More than 250, my friend. Yes. 
just for my excuse to yeah. remember. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so when I ask like, hey, Holger, can you do, you know, this one, this one, this one, you know, there's a pretty freaking big library in the background. So, so you're doing, you're doing really well. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the, the, the strategy intro canvas that you have in the middle yeah. is, is really what, what we would call, a, it's a foundational tool. It's a cornerstone. It's something that we very often bring out. So, yeah. so when we, again, going, going back to the client sessions, we sort of have a discussion like, how is your industry changing and, and, and how do you sort of compete in that space? They yeah. go like, oh, you know, it's actually really tough. And then we bring it over to the strategy intro and we say, well, tell us about your core business, tell us about your growth businesses and tell us about your explore business. Like, what, what does that mean to you? Uh, yeah. What kind of resource allocation do you have? And they go like, oh, this is really interesting. And then they say, you're asking really difficult questions, Chris. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm asking there. They, they emerge. They emerge from the conversation. And then finally, uh, if you want to do the squiggly roadmap, I love it. We, we, I don't do have the, the right curve in it, but it's something like that, right? E exactly, exactly. And then you basically have 10 boxes from le left to right on top. Uh, and this, of course, is the transformation um, transformation roadmap, which has 10 principles. And if it goes from left to, to right, which yeah. is basically, it's a strategy roadmap for large scale transformation. And when people see that Holger, they go like, wow, you know, in, in an hour, maybe hour and a half working session, yeah. you have yeah. helped us understand where we are with regards to how the industry is changing. And as a management team, you know, we recognize that we do not have the same picture. Yeah. Then you've challenged us on our strategy and our resource allocation. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you have shown us that not, not only do you ask really difficult questions, but you're actually showing us a roadmap of what we could do. This is amazing. And then, then they hire, um, well, I'm not going to say us, but they, have, they hire Holger to, to come back and work with them. The <laughs> um, well, reason, reason why I mentioned this, Holger, is, I mean, we're doing exactly the same, but from slightly different angles. And I've never exactly. seen that, you know, as clearly as I, as I just did now. Yeah, yeah. And... I think what's interesting as well, you mix at the end, like I would do with the world map, right? So basically, like I do with the world map too, you have two tools that are focused more on the understanding part. Yeah. And the third part is again, still an understand, but you start creating with them. Exactly. Which leaves people with that feeling of, we actually did something, yeah. Yeah. which is, which is powerful too, right? It's, it, it's very powerful. And, and I think also, Holger, I'm taking a step back, what's really powerful is just, just, just seeing how fast you create these and you know, looking at the screen and, and having now you know, the visual representation mm -hmm. is, is really powerful. I'm, I'm yeah. super impressed. So, and that leads, leads to my next question. So right now we have you know, people like Glenn in Panama. He does a lot of work with, with banks and, and, and banking. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, have, we have David in London. And, yeah. and I know, I mean, just between you and I, I know that they are currently scribbling on, on their post-it notes, like trying to like, how, how, do, how do I actually do this? So my yeah. question, Holger, is if people are watching this and they go like, oh my God, this is fantastic. Mm -hmm. How can they learn? How can they get started? How can they get started? So I would like to take one step back, Chris, for a second and say, for me, there are different like levels of visual interaction. And just to take people away from that feeling of I need to draw or I need to draw well, right? Because um, yes, that might be, might, be, might be cool to see, but these are very rough sketches, right? As well, the ones that I did before, all pretty, pretty rough sketches. Um, so I think... First of all, you need to make that, that step of understanding that you don't need to draw in the perfect way. Let me sh stop sharing for a second so I can talk to you better like this. Um, but it's that like we have kind of a burden in our head or a, res a resistance in our head to, to drawing and sketching, which often holds us back. But if you see most of the presentations that I, for example, do, I use all those simple shapes right? I use a speech bubble. I use like a thinking bubble. This might be even already a bit sophisticated with a pen, but or a pencil here in this case. But in most cases, I'm using those very simple, simple shapes that I can draw quickly and fast, right? When you saw me drawing as well, um, the, the visual tools, it's mostly boxes and some, some, some arrows or so, or 
like often enough, my drawings contain just rectangles, then I might draw like a, a thinking bubble somewhere. I might draw a speech bubble somewhere, right? Like this. And all of a sudden people think I have drawn something on the paper, even especially when I start connecting them perhaps with arrows or like a dotted line arrow or whatever you do, perhaps you put something in the center. If you want to go a bit more sophisticated and say it's about innovation, you might draw an open circle, three lines, something in the middle, let it shine. All of a sudden you have a light bulb, uh, perhaps that's a bit short for light bulb, let's make it a bit longer. So, but basically what I always do is using very, very simple things. The only thing that I do is I connect them in different ways, right? Mm -hmm. So they look new and afresh every time. And the only complex thing I would say I draw are those people here. When you like, you have seen me drawing these these guys here, and girls sometimes too. But like the standard one is the easiest one here. That might be a bit too complicated, but you can as well for a person draw just this figure, right? This is the person too, and you could create a team as well pretty easily, right? That works well in every situation too. So the, the thing that you need to really focus on is how can I make it as easy as possible and don't fall into the trap of creating an artwork, right? It's, I think what I always say, it's a communication tool, right? It's, it's, it should be rough and quick as well um, because people tend to give better feedback if your visualizations are more rough than they are too refined, right? If, they, if you have too refined pictures, um, people hesitate to, I don't know, take a sticky note and put that on top, right? Because they say like, this is so beautiful. Can I really uh, put a sticky note on top? Because that looks kind of ugly when I do that. But if the sketch is like, like this, I mean, that's at least my relatively unrefined drawing. They could, they could start putting sticky notes on top and, and write something. Uh, that's completely fine, right? So never aim for that. And one more thing is don't compare yourself to others ever, right? Because <laughs> you never know how long they practiced. And I am drawing since, I don't know, not since I was born, but let's say two, like 39 years or so. Um, so compared to others, I have a bit of an advantage as well. Yeah. And I think to a certain level, you get very fast. Um, and of course, in creating clarity, I have a short chapter with some icons for you as well that you could just uh, copy as, as well. And I see a question, Chris, by the way, which kind of pens I'm using. Perhaps I'll answer that right away, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah take that. And then I'm gonna give you a bit of a challenge, my friend. Oh yeah, oh, I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> on, the, on the flip chart, on the flip chart, I'm using um, these pens that are from Neuland. Um, I think you can order them worldwide. Flip chart marker, they have a chisel tip. I'm not sure. Let me see how. Yeah, no, that's, that's, good. that's good. So it's it's nice to draw on a flip chart and it's a solid black. So very good to work with. And they have multiple colors too. So these are really good. You can refill them too. So this one as well is like five, six years old. Um, so pretty cool. And when I'm working on paper, like you saw me with the document camera, I would use the Tombow ABT, this one. Tombow ABT, because they have a, a tip that you can write with and they have a tip that you can color with, like a, like a brush pen, which is cool. And then for, for the black lines on smaller paper, I use the Lumicolor. I know you have like a thousand of those too, Chris, <laughs> because they write on our favorite sticky notes, right? Steadies. Um, so can really recommend Steadies, that those are electrostatic mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. We can't, yeah, there, yeah. Um, those are electrostatic post-it notes. And I used, for example, just in the beginning, the transparent ones, which I really like, right? Because you can put them on a drawing and they, and you can draw on that without disturbing the drawing too much. So that's a question to the, um, the, the Tombos you can't refill, right? The Tombos are empty. And the brand of the, of the stickies is Stetis. S T A T T Y S dot com. Um, Alina, could you put studies in the uh, in the in the chat, please? 
because the, the the study notes for those of you that are not familiar and i can't believe they're, they're right there they, they are a must so 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 spend all your money like i mean all your money buying studies that will make your customers more happy yeah absolutely absolutely um Holger, I want to I go back and I want to challenge something you said. And we have our good friend Donald Hawthorne from Boston joining us. Donald, I'm going to try to bring you into this conversation. It's going to be a little bit sort of, uh, you know, impromptu, but it's going to be fantastic. So, okay. um, Donald, I'd like you to think about it. And I'll give you about a minute to think about it. But, uh, you know, given, given your industry context, I'd like you to think about what are the top three challenges a CEO face so in your life sciences background industry, uh, what are the top three challenges that a CEO face? I'm going to come back to you in about one minute. Now, Holger, I, I agree that you make it look simple. And I agree that to a certain extent, people like anyone can draw what you drew behind you. I mean, I, I can draw the arrow and I can do the box. <laughs> so, you know, so far, so good. But you have a super skill, which really separates the drawing from the thinking or really combines the drawing and thinking that's better. Because what I have observed is you are able to take a very complicated conversation and you simplify it before you visualize it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So here, here, here's the test. Uh, could you do a blank flip over on the back, please? And uh, we're going to, we're going to bring Donald in. Yeah, I do the I do the other camera thing again, so that yeah, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, comfortable for me. So, so what we have here is that we have a very experienced life sciences CEO, yes. and his name is Donald. And he's based in Boston, and he's going to tell us. Uh, and Alina, I don't know if we can do audio or if we need to do um, um, if we need to do chat, but but uh, he's going to tell us the top three challenges that a life sciences CEO face. And then you, my friend, are going to visualize it because I want to show how good you are, not just at the drawing, but at understanding it. So, okay. Donald, we're going to bring you in here. So tell us, tell us a little bit for a moment here, Donald, that if you're a life sciences CEO, what are the top three challenges you typically face? Thanks, Chris. Um, I think the first challenge is broader than just the industry it's that you're always busy mm -hmm. and you're busy with things that end up being distractions, mm -hmm. not critical. Mm. Right. I think the second thing, if I may move on to that, really yeah. goes that you were saying, that both of you have been saying, which is there is a lack of clarity about customer needs mm -hmm. and it's not only a lack of clarity it's a lack of curiosity to really dig in and ask questions that let them tell you what's going on mm -hmm. and the final thing would be, all right, now you, you have a sense of clarity about unmet customer needs. Now, how do you go to market? Mm -hmm. And Chris knows this, uh, but I define go to market as the combination of product market fit business model fit and organizational fit. So it's an integrated roadmap that says, look, it's more than just, you know, hey, we, we sell. Mm -hmm. Sure. So Donald, could you just expand a little bit on the last point? Because there's a lot of information in there. Like what, what, what do you mean when you talk about unmet customer needs and go to market and, and, and the go to, go to market fit? The, if you look at the failure rates for products, the statistics are overwhelming. 70 plus percent fail. Mm -hmm. yeah, my, my argument is that if you're a CEO, you want to build a great and enduring company. And the way you do that is you have to persuade investors, 
partners and customers that they should care enough to invest, partner, or buy your product. And the way you do that is through offering product market fit and business model fit and an organizational fit. Chris, mm -hmm. does that go far enough in the direction you wanted me to go? Yeah, no, this is, this is, uh, this is great. Um, Holger, we're going to give you, uh, you know, you know a, a minute or two to, I know you're working. I know you have a lot of stuff in your, in your, uh, sort of yeah, on, on your mind right now. Good. I'll give you a minute or two. Um, <clears throat> but what, what I want to show here, and Donald, you can just stay on the line for, for a minute or two more, is, you know, just from, just from a very, very short, and again, um, understanding session, you know, we're able to, um, clearly visualize a couple of elements, a couple of cornerstones, if you will, that, for example, in the coaching conversation, like, like David would run, may actually allow you to really align and create clarity on what is the challenge a CEO faces. And then if you are, again, let's say in a coaching relationship, coaching conversation, you can now use this as a foundation for the conversation or even the development process uh, and you can simplify and visualize then you can also anchor in those three and then next you would then go to work on solutions actions mm. yeah. so Donald, uh, Hogger is still working and he still has some, some things he wants to put on but in this little discussion what, what are you seeing here what, what, what's, what's coming at you from the screen well, you know, I, I, what you and both of you said earlier about PowerPoints really resonated because, good Lord, they're boring, they're so stereotypical, and they don't induce a conversation. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm reacting to the visual nature of what he's doing, and it's, it, I, it's, it's, it's a dialogue. And if, you think, if you think about what's really missing is it's, you're either didactic or you're dialoguing. And, and the didactic just turns everybody off. It's like, you know, I'm a CEO. I don't need you to walk in as some outsider and tell me that I don't know what I'm doing. I mean, even if I don't, I'm not going to tell you I don't. You know, it's like, come on, I'm the CEO. I'm supposed to know what I'm doing. You know, all that sort of ego and you know, stuff that sort of goes yeah. with the role. And so th it's really about drawing you into a conversation where you can then self-identify as you're hearing things be discussed, self-identify what is, you know, where, you, where you're vulnerable and therefore need some help. Mm. Yeah, totally agree. Would so you say, Hunger, yeah, go ahead. Well, no, I, I was going to ask you. So, what 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 do you have here? I mean, this this is amazing. Not many of us, if any of us, could could do this. <laughs> yeah. So you put me on the spot. This was not prepared at all, and I hope I got it somehow uh, right. Um, Donald, is it Donald right? Right. Yeah, Donald. Yes. So, how I would present this back, by the way, let me just present that back quickly, and and do a quick preparation. So how I would present such a visual back to people if I if I try to understand something and try to as well learn, like or try to convince others of of the topic as well, I would I would most likely do something like this. It's a pretty rough now because um, we don't have much time for this. But I would say, look, what I heard about the challenges of a CEO, right? The the basically the three biggest challenges of a CEO. I first heard that we're like always busy, a lot of things um, at the same time and the priori priorities are not super clear. So there is a, a sense of overwhelming um, information, things to do and lack of focus. And there is lack of clarity and sometimes even lack of curiosity about the unmet needs of their customers, right? The question is, do I focus internally, externally? Where do I focus? Do I really want to do that? Am I super clear about what my customer wants and the needs? And then even if a CEO managed to focus on the right things, 
do the right things and get clarity on the unmet customer needs, it's still difficult to have a clear go-to-market strategy. It's often unclear because it's so complex to create that product fit, the business model fit, and the market fit at the same time, uh, all at once, so to say, while knowing, and that is the last piece, and that would be my assumption, due to a high failure rate of 70% in the market, there might be a lot of fear of failure within a CEO as well, right? Because if you do the wrong decisions, a lot of things going wrong. So it'll be my back presentation. Did that somehow resonate? That's just fabulous. And, and I would just, I'd give you one added clarity point possibly to the 70%. Yes. The, the way I like to think about it is you're always facing value inflection points. You're either driving the creation of new value or yeah. you're helping to avoid the destruction of existing value. Yeah. And, and so, the, so then if, if you have that mindset, you get curious. Mm -hmm. And if you're curious, you reduce the risk of fear of failure because as Rita McGrath says, you're picking up the snow melting at the edges before yeah. it becomes a really serious big problem. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So last uh, last question here, uh, Donald. So, so, so right now you got a snapshot. I mean, this was like a three, four minute thing. You got a snapshot of Holger in a one-to-one -one relationship. Could you imagine putting him in inside a room of 120 executives where all the kind of the strategy discussions and all the complexities that you have within you know, the top levels of organizations, and he's able to pick that up, simplify and visualize and present it back. So the whole room goes, oh yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. Uh, that's, that's the super skill. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why I really love working with Holger because he can do this at scale. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be, I'll be in touch, Holger. <laughs> All right, Donald. Um, so one thing I want to say on this, Chris, or two things I want to say on this, Chris, for for like the audience, two things I did here, right? Just to to kind of reemphasize this, I did present piece by piece, and I think that is critical. That yeah. piece by piece presentation, even of a picture, right, is very important to help everybody to focus on the thing that you're just talking right now about. Because if you throw this picture at somebody and talk about it, they will try to read everything, they look at all the pictures and they are not with you anymore. So I would even say this is as bad as a PowerPoint slide, right? If you show it all at once. Always cover things up, present them piece by piece, right? And then everybody can follow. The second thing I want to say on this, and this is going back to Donald's feedback as well. If you have something on paper or visualize it either with a drawing or on a canvas, right? With sticky notes, people have to either agree or disagree. They say, I see that the same way, or they say, I don't see it this way. I see something else, right? I disagree. And therefore you have way deeper discussions and better discussions because you're coming to the point uh, where somebody says like, now Holger that you present this, I think there's something missing because we never talked about the employees and the teams that the CEO has to manage. Where are they? For example. Right? Mm -hmm. What's about the culture, right? This could only most likely, of course, in other ways too, but this can be specifically helpful if we see something like this and ask like, what's missing? And then people can say, here's something missing, there's something missing. Way more specific than if you would have a chat over half an hour and you're rambling back and forth, right? Yeah. Holger, this is a masterclass in demonstration of how you work. And I'm just going to put this in that if any of you are equally impressed, um, like I am, and you want to work with Holger, reach out and he can join you for an online session or a webinar or a client engagement. Uh, He's in such demand, so it's very difficult to get him to travel anywhere. Um, but joining things remotely, you bet. Um, all right. Uh, we have time for some questions. Now, I see a lot of comments, uh, but we're very happy to take any questions any of you have. And again, just, just use the chat, and we'll pick up your questions uh, right away. Yeah. While people are writing, just a quick plug again. So the Creating Clarity book is 
online for, for another 10 days on Kickstarter. And then it will take until the end of the year or beginning next year be before you can get it at retailers. So if you're interested in the Creating Clarity book, head over to Kickstarter. Um, for the next 10 days, it's online. So throw us your questions, whatever you have. You know, I, I think everyone is a little bit stunned. Like that was a, that was a very, very nice demonstration, Holger. Uh, and again, you know, we didn't pre prepare it at all. Yeah, um, yeah that's, uh, let's see. Uh, all right, so we have a, yeah, have a uh, with, with, with a question. Um, Alina, do you want to open the audio or should we just use the, the, uh, the chat? That's, that's up to you. Sorry, can you repeat who I should unmute? Yeah, so we have a hand from, from Yapnel. Um, and my question was whether you can open the audio for a question or if you prefer we use the chat. Yes, open. I, I keep my audio open. Great, <laughs> Thank, thanks for that. Um, I'm, on, I'm on my iPad, so the typing is slow. No um, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, sorry, I joined a bit later, but uh, the, the, the part that I saw was very um, inspirational. Um, I've, I've attended previous uh, session strategy sessions where there was extensive use of uh, visual tools. And what I used was like a 12 meter white canvas on the wall. I just want to get your perspective on um, utilizing a big versus a small canvas. Mm, that's a good question. I think that, that highly depends on the setting. Um, I personally prefer smaller ones because what I often do is I rip them off the wall and put them somewhere else. So um, often I have settings where we decide on the spot that we do something differently than planned. And with smaller increments of pieces, you are more flexible in terms of your design of the room as well. So if you have a huge canvas, everything has to happen there. I'm a big fan of saying for a specific phase, you're in this part of the room for a specific other phase, you're going outside for a specific other phase, you right, you, you break up in small groups. That is way easier if you have smaller canvases and not that huge one on one surface, right? That's how mm. we deal with that. Hope that answers your question, Yeah. We have uh, two more. How do you make best use of your visualization after you present it? So of course, use it in a, in a virtual way, right? So always, take photographs and stuff, but there is a philosophical question behind it. Do you ever need that visual again? So this visual that I just created was a visual that was purposefully for this session. Will it ever really create value after this session? It might, because there are some insights from Donald that we could reuse and say like, these are challenges the CEO tells us, but is there like a value in this year? I don't know. Perhaps it might be a teaching value if you want to say this is how you pitch. But basically, a lot of the visuals that we use are just important for the situation that we're in. And afterwards, we can continue forward with something else. I always like to keep them as an archive. So if you want to go back to them, you can have them. But often enough, I think as that, like they are tools. If we're done with the tool, we can put it back and take a new one for the next time. That's at least how I see it. Chris, you see the same or different? Well, a little bit differently, actually. So, so what, what I like to do and what we've frequently done when we have had sessions together is I, I like to take a lot of photos. So, yeah. so I'll take photos of Holger working. I'll take people, uh, I'll take photos of people working. I'll take photos of the visuals as they're being created. Yeah. And then after the session, I'll also take high quality photos of all the visuals. And then I'll put this together in basically a visual summary of, let's say, the workshop. Mm -hmm. And that really anchors in both the people that were there, uh, the process of creation, uh, some of the detailed content we were working on, and also the, the visual outcome. And, and I know that with many of our clients, Holger, that has been very popular uh, because they, they get a chance to not only see it, but really to relive uh, the, the process of creation uh, again. And, and, and for some clients, I've seen those pictures come up six, seven, eight years after uh, we did it. So, so that's something we would frequently do. And yeah, totally agree. And while you're talking, of course, this is a very simple drawing now. If you have a more complex one that, that perhaps is at the end, the strategy for the next five to 10 years, that might be even something that stays within the company for a few years, right? Yeah. Uh, in, in the floor, uh, on, like not on the floor, but in like on the wall, in the, in the, in the office or wherever. 
still, I think so. Uh, okay, so we have a question from Christian that I think is really relevant. How do you identify the anchor, the main ideas, uh, to be able to put them on the board? Right. So if you try to catch them and somebody's talking about them, some people have the ability to actually, like Donald, right? Uh, he had, of course, the question too, but there was one, two, three. So I, from the beginning, I knew if Donald is answering the question properly, he will come up with three answers, right? And a, as a CEO, he, he is pretty strict on processes. So if he's asked for three, he will most likely give three. Um, and then some people as well emphasize on something where they say, this is very important or something I have seen again and again, or I've seen a pattern that. So a lot of people have verbal cues in their speech that lets you identify, okay, this might be important and this might be just a side information. Things that people repeat in their speech, right? When they talk about one concept multiple times, that might be something that's very important to them. And often enough, it's just in the course of a conversation that you figure that out, not upfront, right? You capture something, capture more, capture more, and afterwards you get rid of that, you rip them apart, um, or you make them more important by coloring only the important pieces afterwards, or you use your colleagues or the other people in the workshop and ask, when we see all of this, what's most important? You give everybody, for example, the gluing dots, right? The, the stickers and let everybody put stickers on the drawing and then you see, okay, those are the most important things. Sometimes it might be not up to you to decide what's the most important thing as well. Yeah. Oh, great answer. And I think we have the last question here coming in from, uh, from Spain, Holger. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any industries that are more challenging to work with than others? Uh, or not so much? No, I think it's more size of company rather than industry. Mm. So the bigger the company, the more difficult to work with often enough uh, because complexity is raising, uh, political issues are raising, like all that kind of stuff. So I would say it's more bound to the size of the company than to the industry. I think for me, every industry is basically alike. Topics are basically the same as well throughout the, the industries, at least the challenges. Um, so for me, it's always more the setup of the company and the size. Super. Mm -hmm. uh, very last questions, really, really briefly. Uh, what camera do you use to display your drawing? It's called the Epable Ziggy Cam. Um, let me just write that quickly in the chat. Epable Ziggy Cam. It's a document camera um, that you, it's a USB Epable Ziggy Cam. I, I can also just mention that I've, I've tried different USB document cameras, um, and, and this one is, is one of, of several, but clearly clear, clearly the preferred one. Mine, um, is, mine is six years old and, and still running well, and the quality is still good enough for uh, mine. So. Mine, mine was bad when I bought it, and it's still bad. <laughs> yeah. All right. Holger, we're, we're coming up on time. It is always a pleasure to see you. Uh, I love your work. I love your book. Um, I'm kind of envious with the horse, but we'll save that for a different conversation. Uh, thank you very much for joining. Go back to your vacation day uh, if, if you can. And for everyone joining from pretty much all over the world, thank you very much for joining. The recording will be sent out. Go buy the book, buy some study notes, buy some pens, and really practice like all of us, all of us need to. Thank you. Thank Chris. you very much, Hogger. Have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, to be here.